So hey, what's going on dudes and dudettes? You might think that I look a bit different. Well, it's because I do. If you guys want to find out how and why I look different and what that means for the channel going forward, I'll have a channel update video out sometime later today, so be sure to check it out. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the DualSense controller, because recently some subscribers of mine have brought it to my attention that I actually have no clue what the thing does. Huh. I mean seriously, can anyone watching this video actually say how the DualSense differs from the DualShock 4 besides its built-in mic, USB-C port, and appearance? And don't say adaptive triggers and haptic feedback because I'm pretty sure you've heard those buzzwords enough to want to bang your head against the wall. Now I don't mean to say that there's no differences between the DualShock 4 and the DualSense, make no mistake, there definitely are, but what exactly are they and why should we as the consumer care? That's what this video is going to aim to answer, so sit back, relax, and hopefully I could spread some information as well as some grounds for speculation today. A bit of a warning though, this video might get ever so itsy bitsy teeny weeny physics intensive, so if you don't like physics, I'm sorry. However, I would try my best to keep things as simple and to the point as possible in an attempt to make this stuff easily digestible. So without further ado, let's get into the bulk of the video. Okay, so dual sense. What are the key differences found within this controller that separates it from the rest? Well, in my mind, there are only two, those being haptic feedback and adaptive triggers. Okay, this looks bad. I know just a moment ago I told you that both these phrases were just buzzwords, and that's because they are. I mean, technically, every single PS4 controller also had haptic feedback because of its vibration motors, and a lot of third-party controllers came with adaptive triggers. And technically, phones have been coming with haptic feedback technology for as long as they could vibrate, so a pretty long time. So saying that the PS5 controller comes with either technology shouldn't be too exciting. And at face value, it definitely isn't. Like, haptic feedback? old news. Adaptive triggers? Third party controllers have always had that. Is what I would say if I didn't already know that the engineers over at Sony might have truly outdone themselves if this thing ends up working like I envision it in my head. You see, the cool part about the DualSense isn't that it simply incorporates these technologies, but it's how it incorporates these technologies that sets it apart from the rest. And boy, it's pretty ingenious. Now, for those of you guys who might not know, Mark Cerny, who has been the lead PlayStation engineer for several generations now, has confirmed that instead of using a traditional rumble motor to provide haptic feedback like in the DualShock 4 and pretty much every controller ever, the DualSense will use voice coil actuators. Allow me to provide some context. For literally decades now, video game controllers have been using what is known as rumble motor technology to provide feedback and vibration to your controller whenever necessary. In the DualShock 4 for instance, its rumble motor simply consisted of a semi-circle shaped metallic piece that was attached to a spinning mechanism that whenever activated could cause said metallic piece to start rapidly rotating. And since the metallic piece was purposefully off center, whenever it began to rotate, inertial forces kind of tugged at it a bit in every direction as it made its way around a full loop giving off that tried and true vibration feeling we're all used to from controllers nowadays, and very similar to, let's say, something spinning on the end of a rope. And this kind of rumble motor isn't exactly limited to the DualShock 4. As I mentioned earlier, pretty much every vibrating controller in existence, including controllers from the Xbox side of things, use a form of rumble motor to create vibration. And for what it's worth, it's a good technology, I mean, it hasn't failed us yet. Though for me personally, it was never really quote unquote a necessary feature, since all I really played were high accuracy twitch shooters like Call of Duty and Battlefield, so I just turned it off most of the time, and I can imagine a lot of you guys do too. And the reason for that might be because rumble motors aren't very accurate. They typically only provide vibration to a single part of the controller, and for the most part, take time to wind up and time to stop, because you can't just make a physical piece of metal like our semicircle just instantly stop moving. That would violate like, I don't know, at least 26 laws of physics, probably. And because of that fact, rumble motor vibrations are pretty sloppy and often bleed into time frames where you typically don't want them to occur. Like if a grenade goes off next to you in Call of Duty and having the corresponding rumble vibration throw off your aim from an enemy even though the grenade was nowhere near you and had long since blown up. Now enter voice coil actuators, which is a vibration technology so precise that it was originally developed to be used in speakers. Yeah it's precise enough to replicate sound, hence the name voice coil actuator. That fact in and of itself is enough for us to have a little bit of fun in this video. And by fun, I mean, grab a seat. This is 
this is gonna be a long haul. Okay, so before I explain how voice coil actuators work, I need to preface this with two things. Thing number one, I don't work at Sony, so while I know what voice coil actuators do, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that this oversimplification that I'm about to give to you won't be entirely indicative of how the DualSense controller will work, but it will give you a very clear idea of how it is quite literally leagues better than your traditional rumble motor. And thing number two, before we even try to explain why voice coil actuators are as big a deal as they are, we need to first establish the basis of physics behind it so things might get a bit dicey from here on out but I'll try my best to simplify it as much as possible so if you guys didn't already know electricity is part of a dual force system called electromagnetism as in you can't have electricity without magnetism and you can't have magnetism without electricity they are literally two sides of the same coin and changing one will have an effect on the other kind of like how space and time go hand in hand and mass slash energy go hand in hand I'm sure you guys might have heard of Einstein's theory of special relativity which pretty much states that the more gravity you have which is space the slower time passes and also the faster you're going which is traveling through space the slower time also passes i'm sure you guys have all heard the party trick fun fact that the clocks on the international space station actually tick slower than the ones on earth because of how fast it moves and so fun fact if you were to hypothetically fall into a black hole and somehow manage not to die from your perspective your fall would quite literally be infinite and you would see all of time pass as you fell all of it. The gravity of a black hole is thought to be so great that it's often taken as infinity in mathematical calculations, which means that someone experiencing that level of gravity would literally have their time slowed to almost a halt, while everything else pretty much speeds up from their perspective. And if you guys have ever heard of the famous equation E equals mc squared, it's actually part of Einstein's mass energy equivalence theorem that states that mass and energy are two sides of the same thing. It actually stands for energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, implying that mass and energy are also part of a dual physics system, just like space and time and electricity and magnetism. And the reason I mentioned all of this is to get you used to the idea that a lot of things in physics actually come in pairs. It's a pretty difficult concept to grasp because two seemingly unrelated things like the emptiness of space and the passage of time or something's inherent mass and how much raw energy it is are pretty weird concepts to wrap your head around. But I'm here to tell you not to question yourself too much and to just take this stuff at face value. They are literally just laws of the universe that by and large don't really need an explanation. They just are like electromagnetism. But to get back on track, everything that is able to generate electricity also generates magnetism. In fact, it's pretty fair to say that electricity or the movement of electrons is what causes magnetism. Or rather, electricity is magnetism. Well, not really, but they're one and the same thing. And that fact is what voice coil actuators use to provide their more refined haptic feedback. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's define exactly how these actuators take advantage of this situation. You see, in electromagnetic physics, there's something called a Lorentz force, and its definition is pretty easy to comprehend on paper. According to Wikipedia, a Lorentz force is simply the combination of electric and magnetic force on a point due to electromagnetic fields. Which is easy enough to understand because it basically simplifies to a force created by the phenomenon of electromagnetism. But visualizing it is a bit harder than meets the eye. You see, the Lorentz force is created when you have an electric current going in one direction and a magnetic field going in another direction. And because these two forces are two sides of the same coin, you could think of them as being in this weird awkward same dimension, meaning that since they're close to one another, they're obviously going to interact. The magnetic field generated by the current wants to line up with the magnetic field already present. Well, not line up per se, but for all intents and purposes, we could kind of think of it like that. Though it's it's more of an attract and repel sort of situation. So what happens? When they come into contact, they generate a Lorentz force in a direction perpendicular to where they both meet. This force will either cause an attraction or a repulsion depending on the direction of the current and also the direction of the magnetic field. The Lorentz force is the reason that if you put a magnet or a strong electric current near a compass, you temporarily jam its capabilities, and it goes all wonky. It's the Lorentz force essentially trying to align the weak magnetic field of the compass with the strong magnetic field of the electric current. In fact, this alignment principle is the reason why compasses even work in the first place. They are delicate enough to detect the magnetic field of the earth and properly align itself with that. So the north pole of the compass always points towards the north pole of earth, even though technically the magnetic south pole of earth 
Earth is actually in the North Pole and the North Pole is actually the South Pole. Regardless, you were today years old when you learned why they call it the North and South Pole in the first place. And if you still don't get how the Lorentz force works, let me provide you with one more visualization from the National Magnet Laboratory. So as you can see, in this video, we have a wire connected to a small power source and a switch that can stop the flow of current at any time by being opened or closed. We also have this weird tower looking thing which doesn't do much besides take up some energy from the battery and allows this section of the wire to be on a free pivot meaning that it could swing back and forth. Now I didn't explicitly mention that when current flows through a wire as represented here by positrons which are the opposite of electrons, don't ask why that's the case that's just scientific convention. Seriously. Anyways, as electrons flow through the wire, I never explicitly mentioned that the magnetic field it generates actually occurs around it in a rotational manner, but that's going to be very important when we see how the Lorentz force comes into play. And here we have a permanent magnet which generates an upward magnetic field from its north to south pole. Now, what do you suppose would happen if we were to place the magnet directly surrounding the raised section of wire? We have a magnetic field going straight upward from the magnet and a current that for all intents and purposes will be traveling in this direction perpendicular to said magnetic field. So like I said, what happens? Well a Lorentz force will be generated, don't believe me? Take a look at this. The wire gets repelled and sent to the right and the Lorentz force attempt to quote unquote line up the magnetic field of both the wire and the magnet. And if we change the direction of the current by flipping the battery, its magnetic field will also change switching from clockwise to counterclockwise and changing the direction of the Lorentz force too just like I mentioned earlier. And yes, flipping the magnetic field of the magnet itself will also have the same effect. But all of this physics nonsense aside, let's finally get on to explaining the actuators. And don't worry if you didn't understand a single thing I said, it's actually ridiculously complicated so I didn't really know how to go about simplifying it without bringing in like 9 other prerequisite topics. The only thing you need to take away from that section is that if there's an electric current in one direction interrupted by a magnetic field going in a perpendicular direction, that will produce what we call a Lorentz force, and that's just a fact of life don't overthink it too much. So if we slice into a voice coil actuator like the one seen in this picture, it's really just a wrapped up piece of electric wire as illustrated by this copper plate that is able to generate current in two directions, in this case either clockwise or counterclockwise, and that is paired with a permanent magnet that has a strong polarity and therefore generates a strong magnetic field. Said magnet can only generate this field in a single direction from the north to south pole. Now remember the Lorentz force. Here we have within the dual sense controller a permanent magnetic field that is stationary and unchanging as well as a layer of copper wiring that is able to generate a current in a single direction, either clockwise or counter. And if you haven't noticed the current will always be perpendicular to the magnetic field which is exactly what we need to generate a strong Lorentz force. Here's a visualization of the magnet outside of the coil. So if the developers were to turn on the current at any point during their games, a Lorentz force would be generated in a given direction causing the coil to be repelled if the current is clockwise or attracted if the current is counterclockwise. And if they were to quickly oscillate between opposite current directions, they can actually flip the direction of the Lorentz force rather rapidly, producing a typical vibrating effect that unlike a rumble motor can be stopped on a dime since there are no heavy moving parts to account for. Sony has said that this has allowed the DualSense to be highly programmable and will allow for much finer vibrations. And get this, we know that the alternating current quickly changes the direction of the Lorentz force producing a vibration effect, but since the coil won't ever cover the entire arm of a controller, it moving up and down changes the depth at which you are able to feel the most vibrations and fun fact, depending on how exactly the permanent magnet is built and whether or not Sony makes it, let's say, rotatable, then it is theoretically possible that the actuator could even control the exact point and angle you feel a given vibration through the controller. Which kind of goes hand in hand with the reports that Spider-Man Miles Morales will use this feature as the Spidey Sense mechanic, taking advantage of its extreme precision to actually alarm you of enemies by let's say sending a vibration to the bottom right section of your right controller grip and nowhere else. The level of detail here might really be ingenious, and while the traditional rumble motor could just shake your controller, the voice coil actuator found within the DualSense could possibly do so, so much more. And notice how I said possibly, this stuff isn't confirmed. I know I got a bit ahead of myself in this video, but that's only because I realized there would be a voice coil actuator in the DualSense, so the physics nerd in me just had to explore every possibility that could happen. And technically speaking, this level of precision might be possible. Is it probable? 
Probably not, but it's nice to know that we have something cool to look forward to besides the PlayStation 5 console itself. Now, that was super complicated, but I hope you guys were able to follow along kinda or at least stick around to appreciate what the DualSense could be capable of because this is probably the coolest tech I've seen for a controller in a while. But moving on to the second thing that separates the DualSense from other controllers out there in the wild, and don't worry, I promise this one will be quick, it's Sony's take on adaptive triggers, which is honestly a take I've admittedly never seen before, even though it seems so blatantly obvious. If you guys didn't know, whenever you pull a trigger down on the DualSense, if game developers decide it necessary, they could tighten them up and make them harder to press depending on the action you're trying to perform. Think drawing a bow and having the trigger become more and more resistive as your bowstring becomes more taut, or pulling the trigger on a gun and having the trigger be very, very tense until it makes it past the break point where the gun is fired and loosens up to be easily pushed the rest of the way down. The developers of Deathloop have even come out and say that when your gun jams in the game, your triggers will become so stiff that you can't even pull them, and that is what Sony's adaptive triggers are. And it's pretty crazy to me that up until this point, no one had ever thought of implementing this version of triggers into their controllers possibly because they are very difficult to implement or because the tech wasn't there yet. Either way, it's coming to the DualSense. And while I'd love to have given you guys an equally detailed explanation on how adaptive triggers work, I can't because I honestly have no idea since unlike the haptic feedback motor, Sony has given no details as to what technologies power the adaptive triggers. But if I had to guess, since Sony is going ridiculously crazy with magnets this time around, I wouldn't be surprised if it has something to do with that as well. But with that being said, that's what a DualSense controller does, and why you should probably be excited to get your hands on one and try it for yourself. I for one, cannot wait. And before I go, I want to remind you guys that you are awesome, and to let me know what you guys think of all this stuff down below in the comments. Was it hard to follow? Was it easy to follow and interesting? Please let me know because this script was a bit difficult, and by a bit, I mean a lot of difficult to write, so I'm curious as to what your feedback is. Alright guys, you know what time it is. If you liked the video, leave a like. If you disliked it, disliked. And be sure to subscribe to never miss a future upload on the channel. Oh, and hit that bell notification button if you're so inclined. Stay tough. I've been Innocence. You've been the audience. And I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace out.